It's 7.01. Welcome, everyone. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Uh, we're going to give folks uh, until about 7.05 to join. We actually had about 111, nope, 117 people who registered for this. So we want to give them time to gather. Please review the, uh, the carousel of information that's going through. And we're so glad you're here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome, everybody. We're going to get started at about 7.05. And uh, right now, just getting an overview of who's going to be on here tonight. And we're so glad you're all here. All right, we're at the 50 person mark. That's great. With online registrants, if we get half, we're doing good. With so many Zooms now, a lot of people click the button and say, I'll be there, but then something happens at the end. So we'll have who we have. All right, once again, welcome everybody. We're gonna wait until 7.05 to really kick it off. But settle in, we're gonna keep everybody on mute. And we'll get started in one minute. All right, let's transition. Welcome everybody to the People's Economic Forum. People taking control of the economy. We're gonna get those slides back up in one moment. I am Vanessa Lowe, I'm your host tonight. I host uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's, Financing Philadelphia's Future. It has been a monthly Q&A about the public bank process that we've had for more than it actually, oh, I think it's been at least two years now, or it's getting to be two years. That's a quick half hour session that we do once a month on the last Tuesday of the month. Um, and this one is the start of a series that we're doing to now move into talking specifically about how the actual final that we're going to get to success of having a public bank will affect certain issues in the city. And the issue tonight is affordable housing. This is sponsored by the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition and Philly Neighborhood Networks. Welcome again, everyone. So the purpose of this is to continue the conversation about Philadelphia's public bank. Um, we're going to go, do a slide where we go over some of the milestones of where we are now and getting to where we are now. Um, but right now, I just want to welcome everybody into the room. And we encourage you to use the chat feature. Unfortunately, we can't take your voices, but use the chat feature to enter questions, making note of the person you're asking. Who are you asking the question of? Because we want to be clear about that. But we need those questions because we're going to have two um, fairly substantive uh, Q&A sessions to get uh, your participation in because this is the People's Economic Forum. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So the Philadelphia public banking movement has been going on for a long time. Way back in April, 2012, Philadelphia hosted the National Banking, a National Public Banking Conference. It was a wonderful conference. I remember being there and most of the people who've been doing this hard work, the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition were there and they started organizing. 
They started officially meeting in February 2016. In um, January 2021, they had found a champion within city council because they knew we needed legislation. Derek Green introduced that uh, the first piece of legislation to create a public bank. And then by March 2022, not long ago, a final piece of legislation passed with a 15 to 1 vote. 15 council members voted yes, one voted no to create the Philadelphia Public Financing Authority, which is the interim entity that needs to be created in order to get to the public bank eventually. To get you up to date, unfortunately, in June, I believe, of this year, the Mayor Kenny actually sent a letter to council member Derek Green saying that he would not support the public bank. He was not going to appoint the nine members of the board that were recommended by the coalition, that he was not going to support any kind of funding for the new entity that had been legislated. And um, again, had that legislation had passed 15 to one. So Mayor Kenny's been in the way of that. Um, so at this point, a, v a couple of weeks ago, the coalition actually held a public event in front of City Hall, and the they submitted to the mayor essentially a subpoena to appear at this event and have a conversation with the coalition and talk about why he was objecting, why he was not moving forward. There has been absolutely no response. And unless I'm mistaken, he is not here tonight. Can somebody confirm that, please, from the coalition? Nicole? Confirm, Vanessa, the mayor is not here tonight. Okay. All right. So we're going on because we've got wonderful speakers who are here. Next slide, please. All right. So the agenda tonight, we're going to hear from Reverend, Hol Reverend Gregory Holston um, about uh, generally the sort of the landscape of the challenge. Um, and then we're going to have a panel. It's going to start with Gail Loney, and then we're going to have two speakers, Sophia Lopez and Dina Schlossberg, um, talking about some of the issues around the financing and other challenges um, in the sort of ecosystem of affordable housing. And then we're going to get a legislative update from Council Member Jamie Gautier. And then we're going to end with two people talking about essentially one of the key solutions that's been talked about. Um, and different aspects of those uh, potential solutions or tools to use to support better access to affordable housing. Again, remember to put your questions in the chat, naming the person you're asking the question of. Next slide, please. All right, and now I'll introduce Reverend Gregory Halston. He is with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. He is the Senior Advisor on Advocacy and Policy. Reverend Holster is gonna to talk to us today as he grounds us. He's gonna give us a historical perspective on the affordable housing barriers and challenges. Reverend Holston, welcome. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Philadelphia Banking Coalition. Thank you all for all your work over these years. And my name is Reverend Gregory Holston, Senior Advisor on Advocacy and Policy for the District Attorney's Office. Uh, I think Malcolm X said it best when he said that out of all of our disciplines, history is best to reward our research, that if uh, we understand our history uh, and, and, and understand what has happened before us, uh, we won't make the mistakes of the past. And so uh, my first memory of housing in the city of Philadelphia was driving with my father as a, as a child in various different sections of the city of Philadelphia, mostly in sections that were uh, uh, where there were black people. And in those sections, we would often note the, uh, with dismay and, and sadness in my father's voice, the condition of the community, the condition of the housing, the condition of the streets, the condition of the properties. And like so many black people, my father blamed those who lived there for the conditions, we can do better was as often his phrase. And, but something in my spirit always said there was more to this story than just our ability to do better. And I did not know at that time that 30 years before that a strategy was put in place by our federal government, which determined that 
certain areas in the city of Philadelphia and every major city across the country would be a red line for investment. That means some areas would receive federally backed loans so that people could be able to buy mortgages and be able to build um, and build wealth and build their properties. And certain people would not have federally backed loans. And if banks gave money in those areas, they were doing it at their own risk. And so we quickly recognized that those areas were that were white were the ones who were getting the federally backed loans and the areas that were black were not. And that redlining was not redlining geographic areas, it was disinvesting in the black community. It was disinvesting and investing in super incredible ways in the white community. And that the philosophy behind that was eugenics, the very idea of building the master race that, that hit their claim we were doing right here in the city of Philadelphia and across the nation. It was not an idea that was new for Germany. It was an idea they received from us and, and, and our whole system from the time of slavery. And that we had put in place, in fact, what some have called the Jim Crow of the North. And that that legacy of that Jim Crow of the North went through the 1960s. In fact, much of the turmoil that occurred was because of that lack of disinvestment in communities. The current, the current commission report of 1968 put it, put it well and said, what white Americans have never fully understood, but blacks can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the inner city, deeply in, in, implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, white society condones it. And we just had a short period from 68 to 1980 where we actually were trying to do something about it. We had the Fair Housing Law passed. We had a, a Community Investment Act that we still tried to use that was passed. And we were really trying to attack the, uh, the issue. But in the 1980s, we decided we didn't want to do that anymore. And we spent the last 40 years from a war on drugs to gentrification doing all the kinds of things to reinstitute that very process of disinvesting in black and brown communities and investing in other communities. And, and we see the power now seven generations into this, where we see violence occurring greatly in these areas that have been disinvested as people without opportunity, people without hope, because of the lack of investment in their communities, now turn on each other in violent ways. And we see that our gun violence rate is now up to 563 last year, an all time record. And we blame the individuals for what they do instead of understanding that we created the very conditions that have unleashed the violence. And so what do we do? We recognize that the redlining has not stopped even the law has been changed. We recognize de facto the law, the redlining still remains estimated by the reveal report from 2018 that two or three times more likely or less likely for black people to get a mortgage today, right now in this city than, than, than a white uh, person would get. And we also recognize that maybe as much as a billion dollars worth of resources, uh, uh, investment in black and brown communities are lost every year because we're still discriminating in this way. And so we continue to draw wealth more and more out of black communities and brown communities right now. But well, here is an opportunity before us and here's our discussion today. Here's an idea that can begin to address the problem. Here's an idea that maybe can start to get us and move us in the right path. An idea of a public bank, an idea that we can use to, to correct the racism of the past, to build the kinds of investments in our community using our dollars, using our tax dollars to create and end the wrong. That maybe we can set the pattern for a nation and maybe we can get our own federal government to start to back this kind of back bank the way they did banks back in the 1930s to create the change to build a multiracial, multicultural, multi-income level community where we're all living together and, and, and all are going to the same schools together that we can really still live out the dream 
in the hope of Martin Luther King to build up the beloved community if we dare to take the challenge to change our government policies and our institutions so they reflect the best of us and not the worst of us. So I thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak. And I know that everyone here is dedicated to that and we wanna build this movement for change in this city and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Holston. I had asked earlier as we were gathering, I said, now is Reverend Holston gonna say a prayer? And they were like, no, 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 no. He's just gonna shock. I said, I, I think he kind of went there and I'm glad. So thank you for that. It was a moving and truth talking uh, statement you made there. So thank you for that background. All right, let's now move on. I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Gail. All right, so Gail Loney is with us and we're moving into sort of a moderated um, panel with a couple of uh, speakers right now. Gail Loney first is a community activist and strategist who chairs the Philly Neighborhood Network's housing action team. She's also a lifelong Philadelphia resident. Gail, welcome, and I'll let you take over this panel. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for that introduction. As, as a lifelong North Central community resident, I am happy and excited to be here. Um, housing is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and every day there is a headline about housing in the news. Philly races to aid local renters. Affordable housing we can't afford. Investors brought up a number, a record number share of homes in our community last year. Philly property tax, rapidly gentrifying areas could see more major spikes. And what happened to Senator Street's announcement about the 945 million in redevelopment grants for North Philly? Will those projects benefit housing that is affordable? And now city council is considering new requirements for affordable housing, which calls for inclusionary zoning, which is an old idea and not necessarily inclusionary to all. So now I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of folks on our panel who will help to demystify some aspects of the financial and economic landscape of public banking and the potential positive impact to the city's longtime housing issues. I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, Sophia Lopez of Acre, the Action Center on Race and the Economy. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you. Sophia? Hi, I'm right here. Hi. So nice to be here with you all. I know I had a couple of images I want to show you, but they don't get important until later. So I'm, I'm happy to get going while we pull those up. Um, so ACRE, my organization, Action Center on Race and the Economy, is a racial justice and Wall Street accountability organization. I spend most of my time supporting tenants and fighting for their rights against particular uh, large corporate landlords. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean when I say that. Uh, but by and large, the question again, more often than anything else is help me understand who owns my property. Help me understand who my landlord is and how can we fight back against the things that they're doing, given that we know that they're motivated by greed. Um, it doesn't look like my slides are up yet. Perfect timing. Uh, great. If we could go to the next one, there are just a couple of definitions I want to share. So people might have heard this term financialization of housing. A lot of folks use it to describe what's happening in our housing market right now. So I just wanted to give that context. Financialization is basically the expansion of finance into every single part of our lives, right? I, we see this through the, like, the use of debt, different control over particular industries and even our political system. So I spend a lot of my time looking at the ways in which these large landlords that are owned by investors also intervene to block us from winning the things we need. I know in the chat, it's the same situation, right, with the banking industry and, and seemingly the public bank in Philadelphia too. Another one of these words that I use often is corporate landlords. So when we talk about that, we mean 
landlords who are amongst the largest real estate players in the country. They're focused on growing their profits through increased rents and fees. They're saving their own money on cuts to maintenance. They're churning people out through evictions, and they're expanding their portfolios using public and private money. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the last one, people have probably heard of private equity firms buying up more and more of our housing. So just wanted to share a definition from Eileen Applebaum and Rosemary Bott, two scholars who spent a lot of time thinking about the private equity industry. So they, their definition more or less is these are companies that pool their money from investors. This includes pension funds, insurance companies, endowments from universities or foundations, and other high net worth individuals. And they use that money to buy other companies. So these sources of investment capital are pooled into private funds, and there's no requirement for public disclosures. And as a result, there's so little oversight and so little accountability. This is basically the opposite of what a, a public bank is. So my next slide is just how did we get here? Um, so corporate landlords aren't new, but they really took off after the foreclosure crisis. A lot of my research in particular is focused on single family rental landlords, but private equity and corporate landlords are in all part of the market. Multifamily, low income housing tax credit properties, these like subsidized programs, private equity has realized that's a good place for them to invest. Also manufactured housing, student housing, you name it, they're there. So I go back to 2018. One study estimated that these institutional, actually, sorry, 2007, the term, the, the single family rental industry, so these like individual homes put up for rent were owned and operated by mom and pop landlords. In 2011, there was no company that existed that owned more than a thousand of these units. When we fast forward to 2018, there's one study that estimated that these companies backed by institutional investors or private equity companies owned as many as 300,000 of these units. And I've seen data that showed in 2021, it was 350,000. These companies are huge. It's five companies that own those 350,000 units. And we know since 2021, that number has only been growing. So this is referred to an asset class. It was really birthed out of the foreclosure crisis. And as we all saw, there was this massive transfer of homes from households, especially of households of color that were trapped by this awful predatory debt to Wall Street through millions and millions of foreclosures. I actually was living in Philly at the time when it happened. I think all of us remember just the total devastation that we saw in our communities. Those home prices bottomed out. A lot of these companies were sending individuals who represented them to courthouses across the country to bid on these foreclosed single family homes, oftentimes with the owners still living in them, knowing that there were going to be this whole swath of people who didn't have another option. So anticipating that they would rent these houses out to them. I think as a lot of us also might know, these public companies were also the beneficiaries of federal programs that helped them actually purchase all of this housing. So there were these for these non-performing loans when people had fallen behind the federal government ended up selling a bunch of these loans to these investors. And we also know that uh, Fannie Mae, for example, gave Blackstone, some of you all might have heard of Blackstone, a billion dollar loan guarantee to buy up foreclosed homes. So these companies are really the making of the federal government. They've changed some of those programs, but some of them still exist, certainly in the multifamily side. So what does it mean? Um, we know that this, the, the feeding frenzy has accelerated with the pandemic. I know I saw a lot of quotes from investors saying things like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. When things get really ugly, that's the time that you really want to invest. So again, imagine all the devastation we saw in our communities throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. That was an opportunity that felt unsurpassed for a lot of these investment companies, which is just horrifying. They are nothing short of it's like disaster capitalism on full display. So what does it mean for people today? I think there are a lot of folks who, of course, are very concerned about folks being locked out of home ownership opportunities. And we should have conversations about that. But one of the points that I like to make is I'm in touch with organizers who work with tenants who are actively being harmed by these folks as landlords now. So I mentioned, you know, they have these increasing rents. I've heard stories from North Carolina, Las Vegas, Lots of other parts of the country where people are facing maybe $100 to $200 per month rent increases and a ton of pressure to 
sign a new lease really quickly. And if they don't, they that triggers a month to month lease where they have to pay double rent per month. And we've also learned that there are all of these kind of like algorithmic pricing tools that exist. There was a big ProPublica article about it recently and in being used in ways that might also be violating antitrust law. Fines and fees are yet another way that these companies recoup lots of money and also trying to offload uh, things that normally a landlord would have done onto the tenant. So they get to save money that way. And just one figure, one landlord in particular told their investors that they would be able to take in $640 per home per month in fee and other revenue. That's on top of rent. And they were planning to increase that amount to $850 to $950 per month. So just really horrible. And that landlord, also another one of these who said the pandemic was a godsend for our business and said it was the best thing that had ever happened to them. Then there are all kinds of stories about horrible cuts to maintenance, There were folks that I was working with in Minneapolis who told me sometimes people had to wait up to a year for really life-threatening repairs, things like broken stairways, holes in roofs and ceilings, appliances that didn't work, heat, cooling that didn't work, all those kinds of things. And then also we see lots and lots of evictions. So there was a report that came out earlier this year from the House Financial Services Committee and they were talking about the tactics that many of these large landlords use to evict folks. And they gave the example of knocking on people's doors in the middle of the night, changing out unit uh, AC units with ones that don't actually work. Horrible, 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 horrifying things. And all this happens behind these opaque LLCs that make it really difficult for people to know who owns their home. I am so quickly running out of time. There's so much more I could say. I just want us to be very, very clear that none of this is like all of this clearly dovetails and maps onto the things that the Reverend was saying earlier. We know that housing policy in the U.S. has always been deeply racist and these companies are taking advantage of that. So if it's the foreclosure crisis, well, of course, that means that a lot of these companies, I think we can go to the next slide. Maybe my last slide. Let's skip this one for a second, this map. So this map actually shows where last year investors concentrated their purchases of homes. I know Philly enough to know that, of course, this maps perfectly onto where Black folks live in the city, right? Where those like really, really dark colors are. Um, There's also, there's been tons of research that I'm happy to share if folks are interested to show where this plays out, not just in Philadelphia, but in communities all across the country. I talk about the most straightforward fix for these issues being tenant protection. So that includes things like protections from excessive rent increases and fines, just cause eviction tools that require landlords to give a reasonable justification if they're going to evict someone, a tenant right to counsel and a right to organize that also give tenants a fair shot at fighting back against evictions or unsafe living conditions. But I'm really excited to be here with you all because the reality is That's one side of the equation, but we also need to produce more affordable housing that's permanently affordable and truly affordable based on what people are earning. And because private equity is also in the finance of how housing gets built, a public bank is a really great tool to actually create that housing. I'm way over time. I will leave it there, but happy to answer questions that folks have for me. Thanks. (laughs) Wow, Sophia, that was so amazing and more than a mouthful. Um, I have heard uh, some of the same similar stories. Uh, I just went to a tenant, uh, 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 a rent control coalition meeting. Um, And so some of what you just referred to um, are some of the stories that I heard. I've also heard of other stories where um, landlords are saying that tenants can't use escrow. Um, Can you kind of like speak to that and where they're having um, tenants actually sign like this bogus paperwork saying that they won't if you and if you don't sign it right now, your rent that was going to go up two hundred dollars is now going to go up three hundred dollars if you don't sign this form right now. And basically the paperwork, what we're starting to understand was actually illegal. Um, Yeah, they tend to follow the same playbook from one market to the next. Unfortunately, I should have said I used to live in Philadelphia a long time ago. I'm in San Antonio, Texas right now. So happy to be joining you all from really far away. One of the big problems is that our country is a patchwork in terms of tenant protection laws. 
I'm not super familiar with what is or isn't legal in Philadelphia. You all are in a better position than we are here. So I think if you all have the ability to put payments in escrow, I think that's a great tool that people should utilize. And I think it just speaks to the importance of having things like know your rights training. But I'm sure there are plenty of organizations in Philly um, that host, but making sure because landlords do everything they can to try and take advantage of people not knowing all of the legal protections that they have available to them. Even though we know that there could be more, there are things that will help keep people safe. Okay. Thank you so much. I know that you have to leave us. So I'm going to um, say thank you so much and stay as long as you can. Um, And uh, I'm going to go right into uh, my introduction of uh, Ms. Dina Slosberg uh, from the Regional uh, Housing and Legal Services. Uh, Dina? For mute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Gail. I am, um, like as uh, Gail has said, I am Dina Schlossberg. I have been living and working in Philadelphia, the area, for gosh, a really long time. Um, uh, and um, I want to just thank the Philly, Philadelphia Banking Coalition for this opportunity to talk about the urgent needs of affordable housing and the ways in which a public bank might be able to support um, housing needs in the city of Philadelphia. And you know, I used to say that I don't believe America has a housing policy and part of the problems is that we don't have a housing policy and that we, we don't have an organized coordinated housing policy, but I think that that's wrong. I think that we have a housing policy and that housing policy has been really dominated by both market Um, it's a market-driven housing policy, it's a commodity housing policy, and it has a, um, you know, hundreds of years of historic racial disparity in our housing policy. So um, can a public bank um, overcome all of that? No. But can a public bank try and make a dent in some of that, um, uh, disparities. I think that I think that is yes, and I think that a public bank can provide access to capital and access to resources in a way that is different than the framework that we have of public resources and public banking as we have today. So um, I have been doing affordable housing community development work for almost all of my like adult career, and um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about. I'm going to put some framework on where we are in affordability in Philadelphia today, and then we can have a conversation about why and how we think financing has an impact on that. So, um, Tim, if you don't mind just moving to the next slide, please. So I am really happy to be here, and my role is Executive Director of Regional Housing Legal Services. Um, We are a nonprofit organization. We kind of have this quirky name that doesn't really reflect what we do, but we are a statewide program. We are a legal aid office. We are like a sister to community legal services or Philadelphia legal assistance or neighborhood legal assistance in Pittsburgh. Um, We have a unique expertise in affordable, sustainable housing and related components. Um, And we work a lot on the preservation of home ownership and the preservation of affordable housing throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Please move to the next slide. We do a lot of really unique work. Uh, We work both at the city level, the state level. We work in a lot of communities around the state. We are very deeply embedded in working with a community-based process to reach the kind of housing needs that might be Nest, like that might be available or needed or wanted in your particular communities. Um, We do a lot of work. We represent about sixty to eighty nonprofit organizations a year. And we also do a, you know, a tremendous amount of advocacy work. And just a shout out to Dan Hoffman, who's going to be a speaker later, who used to, you know, we were office mates for a while. So it's nice to see Dan. Um, next slide, please. So we all know that housing is fundamental to well-being. And I will say that I entered this work when I was um, a law student and I was a um, walking around Center City and saw the enormous numbers of people who were living on the streets. And um, it didn't seem like, you know, not to be too goofy, but it didn't seem like the America that I had heard about in America, right? That 
the idea that we accept as a society to have people living on the street, that somehow that is just acknowledged as part of the fundamental, I don't know, um, corporate uh, definitions of who has, you know, who has access to housing and who does not. But it, it really moved me. And I shifted my career when I was in law school to really wanting to do affordable housing and community economic development and working towards safe and affordable housing. It is so fundamentally fundamental that it, it it's it's hard to even convey the idea of the of not feeling safe of not being of not having a home of not knowing where and how you can um, be safe is so fundamental that it it it's hard to imagine that we don't see this as a fundamental right in America but we don't um, I believe it should be but that's um, that's just my own kind of value. Um, so in Pennsylvania, there's a critical shortage of affordable homes. We, for every 100 low-income individual, family, or seniors renting in Pennsylvania, there are only 39 rental homes currently available. I think that Sophia brought to the table some of the issues that are going on, which is the corporate takeover of rental housing. Um, but we just have a mismatch between values and, and availability, right? Or maybe it's a not a mismatch between values, but we don't have enough housing for people who need it at the at the income levels where they are. Um, it is very telling. The National Low Income Housing Coalition does a study every year called the Out of Reach Study, and it used to be that many you know um, communities within the country you could rent a modest one or two bedroom apartment based on the minimum wage of the area in which you were located. But nowhere now in the United States will a minimum wage job afford someone a modest two-bedroom apartment, which is just a staggering definition of a lack of economic, um, uh, or the disparity between income and um, affordability. Next slide, please. Um, so to put it so that we're all on the same page and we're all using the same definitions, affordability is dis often described, this came from I remember how far back, but is paying 30% or less of your income to meet housing expenses, utilities, rent, taxes, et cetera. We have a deep critical housing affordability crisis in Philadelphia. We all know this. It's in part based on the fact that our, our, um, our wages are so low and that we have a um, 20 to 24% uh, poverty level that is really embedded in other people who have, who are on fixed incomes um, or who are working with very, very, very low wages. So just to put this into some concrete terms, if an individual is working at the current seven and $25 an hour minimum wage, it would take 81 hours of work per week to afford a modest one bedroom apartment now in Philadelphia. And apartments in Philadelphia are really staggering. Nationally, the Low, the annual, the average rent is over two thousand dollars a month, and in Philadelphia, it's about twelve hundred for different for a one to, a one bedroom. So it's it's very very expensive, and wages are not keeping pace, and we don't have enough housing that has been developed or regulated or preserved to meet the needs of people who are not having their incomes raised in the level that we would need to meet current rents. So there are many studies that have been done to sort of look at where are we in terms of like um, deficit. And by many people's um, definition, we are about 70,000 affordable rental units low for households that are, I'm sorry, that's my typo, that are very low income, particularly people who are at 50% or below of our area median income. Um, so that is an enormous need to fulfill. Um, and um, there's kind of, it's very, very challenging. We can't build our way out of this without some really change in how we view the responsibilities of government. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about home ownership because home ownership is wealth building and also has a lot to do about racial disparity. Um so Philadelphia was always that city that had very high home ownership rates relative to other cities. You know, people grew up in New York City their whole lives and were renters, and that was never considered like a bad thing. 
In Philadelphia, we had this very high home ownership rate and we had very low home ownership costs. So it was about 58, 59, almost 60% home ownership rates for years and decades. Um, by 1950, by 2019, we were down to about 53% home ownership rate, which was still much higher than some other jurisdictions, um, but lower than what we used to be. But wages remain stagnant. And as home ownership rates go up, um, we have a real gap between the way the, the, the sale price of homes as Philadelphia has become a much more sort of I don't know, hot market. I don't know how else to describe it. We have a, it's a hot market. It's a welcoming market. We have really moved in, you know, we could talk about the the strategies we've used to increase the, the housing market, but we have a real um, disconnect between people's incomes and the actual cost of housing now to acquire and buy a house. And this is even before we talked about um, interest rates. I'm not even like beginning to equate interest rates. Um, so it's just a, it's just an income to housing prices differential. Next slide, please. So um, it, the home ownership rates in Philadelphia have, have have declined, but they've mostly declined for the um, African American community and the Latin American community. The Latin community. Um, it's gone up a little bit in the Asian community. There are I. I I knew the time was gonna be very limited today and I didn't wanna to get too down into the weeds, but there are multiple factors that contribute to this disparity. And part of it is the homeowner, is the, is the mortgage rate of approval. That is a much greater disparity for African-American homeowners who are applicants who are applying for mortgages than white um, applicants applying for mortgages. And we could unpack that. I'm happy to try to unpack that. But it suffices to say it is what exactly what Reverend Holston was saying. It's a history embedded in racial disparities and in redlining and in the communities in which they're being served. It has much to do with um, how appraisals are, defined, are, are evaluated. It has much to do with how housing is valued in particular communities, but it also has a lot to do with wage disparities. So um, home, ownership, home, home ownership rates across the country, but also in Philadelphia for African-American families has substantially declined. There was a place from 1960 to 1990 where the rates of home ownership disparity between whites and black Americans had narrowed and now the numbers are climbing again in the opposite direction and unfortunately in a direction that's not positive. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in addition to the home ownership issues and in addition to the, the sort of the overall global rental issues, I really want to, the issues I decided to focus on tonight were ones that I think a public bank might be able to address. That was my point. Like, I didn't want to talk about, you know, um, things that might have to do with other factors that bring to the table about why we have these disparities or this housing crisis, but what could a public bank perhaps in a financing structure bring to the table that might benefit the city? So um, one of the issues that's really telling in Philadelphia, and I think that, that um, the council member Gaudier will probably talk about is the subsidized affordable housing that we have in the city of Philadelphia that is at risk. And we have, um, tens of thousands of units of federally subsidized housing in the city of Philadelphia. It doesn't always serve people the way that we hope it would. And it doesn't always, um, well, it doesn't always serve people the way that we hope it was, but it is subsidized and it allows people to spend less than 30% for much of this housing to spend less than 30% or less of their income on housing um, and housing related expenses. But um, we are at risk because many of these programs came out in the 80s and the 90s and the aughts, and they're at risk of um, reaching their maturity, such as what which happened with University City townhomes. And we have somewhere in the range of 14,000 homes that may that are rental units, but that may be at risk needing signif significant renovations, or reaching the end of their affordability period, and being subject to maybe perhaps going on the market for a fair market buyer because the because we have a culture that says 
that, you know, we, we offer people this opportunity to keep things affordable while they are getting a certain kind of subsidy. And once that subsidy is over, then the owners are free to do with the property what they wish. But um, we also have some very good low cost rental housing in the city of Philadelphia, which we in the wonky world of affordable housing called NOAA, um, naturally occurring affordable housing. But this housing stock is also at risk because the market has shifted so much. And also because of what Akron had talked about that uh, um, many of these single family homes that might have been available even for rental by neighborhood folks or somebody who might've bought a house and fixed it up and kept it affordable are really getting going out to a different kind of market. Um, so we have a real loss and a real um, struggle to hold on to what we have. And I do believe that if we had a public bank, it might be able to be available to help us um, preserve some of this affordability. Um, next slide, please, because I also know that I'm probably running late. Um, so just real quickly, there are some questions and issues that are threats to affordability. Some of them were talked about a little bit. This asset class purchasing a single family housing stock by national and international companies. It has um, been this enormous takeover of property in the last, I don't know, maybe, I, you know, Sophia is going to know more than me, but um, we've gone to having 24% of all single family homes sold nationwide up from about 15% in just 2012. It is an asset stock, as, it's considered an asset class of real estate. Blackstone and all of their funds, their friends are buying this real estate. Um, on the multifamily side, which is a side that I spend a lot of my time with, um, the the theory has always been in the, has been that the developers will develop affordable housing and that investors will invest. And then when the investors have sort of put their money in and their time in, they'll walk away and the properties will remain affordable. Um, men, much of these properties, particularly in the city of Philadelphia, were done um, through the low-income housing tax credit structure. That is a tax structure. And so, you know, it's a tax structure first and affordable housing is the outcome. Um, but that it resulted, it did result in, um, you know, thousands and thousands of units of affordability. But as the market has shifted and as the real estate has become more um, valuable, the investors are purchasing interest in these properties and um, disrupting the options for long-term affordability by the nonprofit owners. And if anybody's interested, Bina. I can give you a lot more detail. So anyway, I just want to say, Bina. yes. Bina, I, I hate to interrupt you and you're on a roll and this is so important, but we have to oh, okay. um, I'm move done. on. I'm done. Um, but you know what? We're going to have to have you back so that you can finish up this conversation because everything that you're saying I am definitely on board with, and I need to hear. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go so long, but like, I'm very wonky because this, I'm very passionate about this, but I, I don't want to give people a structure. <laughs> but I'm done. I'm guilty of the same okay, thing, I'm so done. I understand. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we're going to wait for the Q&A till later on down the line. And like I said, thank you, Dina. Thank you, Sophia, everybody. We appreciate your questions. And we're going to go right into the, the next segment. So I'm going to pass it right back over to Vanessa. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and thank you, Dina, for fantastic information. Uh, let me see the slide for Council Member Jamie Gauthier. Forgive us for our uh, some of our tech challenges. We've got a lot of people's different slides and stuff. All right, so Jamie Gautier represents West and Southwest Philadelphia as the third district city council member. Since assuming office in January, 2020, she's fought for the constituents right to live with dignity and remain in the neighborhood they've called home for decades. She's also the sponsor of a piece of legislation around community land trust. And with no further ado, let me turn it over to council member Gautier. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's so good to be here today. I'm actually in Chicago at a conference about um, progressive housing policy. Um, so I'm going to have to jump off after I speak, but I really wanted to zoom in um, and be a part of the conversation today. And I appreciate you all for the opportunity. 
Um, I know that one thing this group is focused on is supporting more small and in particular black and brown owned businesses in our communities. Um, I think we all will agree that small businesses sustain our communities um, in many ways. They provide essential services. They employ a diverse range of Philly residents. Um, they foster and move forward our local economy and keep our revenue close to home. Um, they are a part of the lifeblood of our communities. Um, and in light of all the obstacles facing um, small business owners, um, I think we all can agree that it's more important than ever that we find new ways to help them bounce back from the challenges that they face. Um, and a lot of these challenges stem from unmet credit needs and other financial barriers. And so that's a big part of the reason why last March, City Council voted to create the Philadelphia Public Financial authority, and that vote was 15 to 1. Um, we saw the need in the community um, on a range of issues. We saw a number of ways that a public bank could help, and we took bold action to address it. Um, but, you know, as, as all of you know, months later, um, here we are, and the mayor is refusing to fulfill um, his duty to nominate a board of um, directors. And so I really appreciate um, this group's advocacy. Um, I think that the inaction is undemocratic. Um, I think it's extremely harmful for our neighborhood minority <clears throat> minority owned businesses, and I think is preventing progress on urgently needed investments from housing um, to small business in West and Southwest Philly um, and across the entire, in, in the entire city. And so um, one thing I want you to know is that I continue to stand with this group in pushing for um, the, the true um, implementation of the public bank. Um, but I also know that city council needs to do more to empower residents, um, especially when it comes to creating um, community controlled um, and permanently uh, affordable housing. Um, in the spring, I introduced a bill that would help to get um, the city's uh, the city's public land um, into community hands so that that land can be put to use for permanently affordable um, and equitably developed uh, projects by community members themselves. Um, I think that the city's thousands of um, publicly owned um, parcels of vacant land, especially those that exist in neighborhoods of choice, are among the most powerful tools that we have as a government um, and as a city to help us achieve our affordable housing goals, um, to help us protect community spaces, and to encourage um, land ownership as a form of wealth building in um, black and brown communities. And so it's key that we're able to hold on to this land um, and protect it from market forces as neighborhoods continue to gentrify. Um, my public land bill does three things. Um, one, it provides additional points in the city's uh, scoring rubric for community land trust and for deeply affordable housing. Um, so it kind of gives community land trust a leg up in the city's land disposition process. Um, second, it allows for organizations, um, community, you know, grassroots organizations to enter a one to five year lease with the city to allow time for um, permitting for their projects and for fundraising. Um, the organizations are would be screened for, you know, their internal capacity and their ability to properly maintain the land during the lease period. Um, and then it would be up to the community group, you know, over that five year period to secure everything that they need for their projects um, before the city transfers title to them. This is something that the city currently does, but on a limited case by case basis. Um, and so if the grassroots organization um, succeeds, the city will transfer the title um, to the, the land with deed restrictions and reversions um, in case the nonprofit uh, should falter. 
Um, third, um, it codifies a process for how the city will operate when multiple parties, including um, for-profit entities, um, submit applications for the same land. If the city receives multiple applications for the same properties within a couple months of each other, the community application will be reviewed and scored first, even if, if it was submitted second, in order to truly give um, community land trust and other um, community grassroots organizations um, the first crack at getting access to land. Um, I can see the land justice bill in response to really strong interest from my constituents in permanent affordability and in community controlled land. Um, we've seen many instances of um, community benefiting uses like affordable housing and community gardens um, in jeopardy because the land isn't controlled by the community. Um, and this is a way to ensure that, you know, those uses can be permanent um, when otherwise they are so often temporary. Um, you know, Dina was talking before about um, the affordable housing crisis that we're in. Um, it, the only permanent affordable housing in Philadelphia is housing that's owned by the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And all the remaining federally subsidized affordable housing um, has contracts or rent restrictions that will eventually expire, in some cases, in the very near future. Um, I see someone dropped um, a link into the chat about the UC townhomes. That's one example of how this is playing out um, across the city. Um, over the next five years, 117 affordable developments in Philadelphia with 5,430 affordable units will reach the point where their aff affordability contracts will expire and owners will be allowed to opt out of maintaining these units as affordable. And when we look forward, you know, 10 years, that number balloons to 218 projects and 12,286 units. Um, and meanwhile, new affordable housing is not being built fast enough to keep up with the increasing demand, putting an even greater strain on um, the rental market. And so, you know, all of the things that we're talking about today that can increase the supply of permanent affordable housing is incredibly important. Um, and you know, two uh, are incredibly important. Um, and so to close out today, I also wanted to take a moment to talk about the importance of community control. All of the policies that um, are coming out of my office are continually informed by feedback from residents in my district. And I pride myself um, on the fact that our office is in ongoing conversation with dozens of registered community organizations, um, civic associations, and community activists. Um, you know, it is true that Philadelphia faces many, many complicated problems, um, and it's impossible for one person or institution to know enough um, or do enough to confront these challenges. But this is why I think we need to empower our communities, um, shower them with resources, um, and make sure that our residents have what they need to create the neighborhoods that they want to see and the neighborhoods that um, they can thrive in. Um, and this is also why we need to build institutions that are directly responsive to those who are suffering the greatest um, impacts of poverty and gun violence and gender in Philadelphia. And so I deeply appreciate the work that this group is doing to really shape um, what's being called for from an economic perspective here in Philadelphia and to make sure that as a city, we're moving forward with the things that um, our, our residents really need. And so thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be here today. Council Member Gautia, thank you so very much. Uh, great comments. I, I feel like we're sort of touching on so many amazing things at the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, but we only have nine, 90 minutes and I wanna make sure we get our other two guests to be able to speak. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker, but remember, put your questions in the chat. I'm not sure if Council Member Gautier can hang with us, but put them in the chat anyway, and maybe we can work on getting them to her to respond to later. 
All right, so now let's move into looking at some practical solutions with our next two guests, please. Uh, go to the next slide. And so Dan Hoffman has spent his career building relationships between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to support community development. Today, he's going to talk about community land trust as one potential tool for addressing housing access. Dan, it is your floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, I want to make clear that, uh, as you said, spent his career. I'm retired so that I, I'm not spending my career uh, the, uh, that way. Uh, I'd like to talk a little about community land trusts here. Uh, I don't know if I'm the all-time land trust guy. I've been sort of off and on thinking about them for, I don't know, 35 or 40 years. So I think I've acquired some thoughts on that. Uh, and I'd like to do two things tonight. One is just give everybody sort of some rough and ready definition of what a community land trust is. And then um, uh, Peter, Peter Winslow, for uh, his sins are mine, uh, asked me to uh, uh, think about uh, not going forward, think about legislation. And, and implicitly, we posed the question, supposing a municipality really wanted land trusts to work, uh, what would you do? What, what, what might a, a municipal government do? And so I put down some thoughts on that. Uh, these are not the all time fancy uh, slides, but maybe they're written in a way that people can, as we try to zip through this in a timely way, uh, they can go back over and look at it and it'll make some sense. And if not, somebody can contact me and we can go on from there. Uh, the next slide, uh, what is a community land trust? It's Three, it really has three tr key traits. One is it's a nonprofit organization that is organized to permanently own land. Uh, one of the points that both the Sophia and Dina were making earlier is the commodification of housing. It's that uh, uh, the finance sector and the marketplace have glommed onto these places and uh, uh, affordability becomes a secondary uh, or third or fourth uh, level issue. Uh, community land trust, by owning the land, take, take the property that's on that land out of the market. So it, that, it be, it's a parallel market uh, and with the goal being we're going to hold, hold, hold these properties and manage them in such a way that they're permanently affordable. Uh, they generally, not all, but they're generally place-based organizations. They worry about a neighborhood or a community or, or some uh, aggregation of, of uh, area as opposed to being, you know, the Pennsylvania Land Trust. On the other hand, in Vermont, a small, the, the nation's largest uh, uh, land trust that uh, uh, started in Burlington now runs, the, go, goes through the whole state. So there's some play there. Frankly, in a city as dense as Philadelphia, I would urge more modest geographies. Um, and thirdly, something that's very important is unlike other nonprofit organizations all have a board, and these do too, uh, land trusts really as a uh, uh, matter of faith is said that the residents of the land trust uh, who live on land trust properties and those who uh, live in that community really have to play a major role in uh, organizing and managing the affairs of the land trust. Uh, and not all nonprofits uh, have that as uh, so central to their organization. Next, uh, land trust focused on home ownership while I say keeping things uh, affordable. Uh, they focus on having mixed income communities um, and they focus I say on improving their service areas uh, not just their properties. So they have a community focus as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, while they principally post, uh, uh, promote home ownership, they can do other things. They can rent, they can uh, lease land to other affordable housing developers. Uh, the key is again, uh, long-term affordability. Uh, and within that idea, uh, they can be very flexible. Next. Uh, they generally set uh, income targets for both the individual housing. If you just think about, you know, some street, well, not all the houses are identical. So they may have different values. So people of different incomes will need to 
uh, uh, will have an interest in buying various units, but they also then set an overall target for what their land trust should be serving the community. Uh, they make housing affordable by charging low land rental fees and uh, uh, controlling property beyond, I guess I really didn't maybe have made this clear. People who live in land trust home ownership situations live with a shared equity agreement. They own the home, not the land trust. It's their home, it's their mortgage. They, within some boundaries, are responsible for improvements, maintenance, it's their home. Uh, the, the key is that at the end, next slide, uh, the key is that under equity sharing, when they go to sell that home, they, just, they can't just put it on the market and get whatever it is. There's an, the land lease provides an equity sharing agreement, which says you can have to sell that home either back to the land trust or on the market, but at a price that we set subject to our agreement. Uh, and uh, that keeps the home affordable. So it's not, it's ownership, but it's not, you don't get it all. Let me uh, talk about that in the next slide a little. It's not for everyone. Some people, when they buy a home, they, uh, they'll want it all. They don't know how they're going to, I've done some polling in years past, they don't know how they're going to ever afford a down payment or a mortgage, but if they ever are, they want it all. And, and the land trust doesn't give it to you all. It gives you only some of it. Uh, and through a formula that everybody will understand at the beginning of the process. They also are, as I noted, are really strive to be democratically run institutions and not everybody wants to be involved uh, some way. Some, some people just want to own a house on the street uh, and that's okay. Let me uh, go to the next slide. Uh, as say on the boards, they represent homeowners, residents, and others. Next. I want to, in the second half here, I would just like to spend some time talking about a, a new strategy uh, based on, supposing you really want these things to work. Next. Um, I, su I suggest that a twofold process be established. One, a process whereby the city gets a broad review of, of what these community land trusts are going to be um, in return for providing real help. And then beyond those two uh, ideas, gets out of the way. Either we trust these things or we don't. Uh, and I've set up a process, some of you may be familiar with neighborhood improvement districts. I wrote the state legislation uh, 25 years ago on that. Uh, it's worked in some ways that I hope, frankly, council has figured out new ways that I haven't anticipated to meddle in the operations in some of them. So uh, it's not perfect, but next slide. The planning process would be very straightforward. Where's your, where are you looking to work? What properties you're looking to control now and in the future? A budget, a governance plan that, that guarantees participation. How would equity sh be shared? How would ground leases be, rents be set? Who are you going to serve in terms of income levels? Um, and what are you going to do for your general service area, not just for the, the properties you come to own? Next. Um, what would you get for it? My experience with, with the uh, neighborhood improvement districts is ultimately it has become a process where bunch of folks come together and say, we will put up money that we don't have to put up in order to get some stuff done. The council has taken a, a view of, we will grant you the right to spend your money if you spend it in ways that we approve of and oftentimes are governed in ways that we have certain influences on. And it's a, it's not a very independent source of power. Let me say, I say in terms of democratizing um, decision makings in, in Philadelphia, uh, neighbor improvement districts have not worked as well as I would hope. I think I'd like to see if try again, I guess, uh, try to hope over experience uh, that uh, we that you have a certification process. Uh, I'm being told I need to close it up here. I'm, uh, 
what I'm saying is we've outlined here, you can look at the slides, I guess, yourselves, um, on things that the city could just award a land trust as a matter of right, not have a negotiation, not be second in line to some land bank that maybe is operating on alternate Thursdays, but in fact, have real power, real access, real money that comes to you as a matter of right, uh, that you're not begging for, and proceed on that basis. Dan, thank you so very much. Sorry to rush you along, but we want to get our last speaker in. Great information. If there's more, if there's a website where people can go and learn no, more, I don't have a website. I don't have a website. Okay, <laughs> you're retired. There you go. All right, let's move on. If we can put Brad's slide back up, please. All right, uh, Vanessa. Just let me say, you're welcome to put up those slides. Thank you. Got it. All right. Next, um, last speaker. So we're we're getting there. Um, we have Brad Forbes. He is the vice president of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, also known as PACA. Um, he's going to tell us about um, his lived experience as treasurer and a member of a cooperative community land trust. Brad, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, really, uh, I'll be drawing on uh, my lived experience to outline a model for uh, a permanent real economy um, that is sort of not based in capital, um, but rather uh, based in real value of, of labor and goods um, as exchanged in a cooperative uh, manner, building on some of the uh, technology, shall we say, of uh, cooperative land trust or, or of community land trusts. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so what is a real economy? Um, it's a place where a contribution of time and labor will ensure access to housing, food, and utilities. Um, it's very, very straightforward. Um, individuals can produce and consume uh, goods uh, and labor uh, and housing uh, independent of capital. So capital doesn't have to play a role. You don't have to deal in capital under this model. Um, uh, a big part of the understanding behind this, and this has been echoed by a lot of the other speakers tonight, uh, is that there's really no such thing as I, as I, as I like to say, there's really no such thing as affordable housing, particularly when you're not um, addressing the uh, economic issues underlying what makes something affordable. If you're not dealing with uh, people's access to the capital economy and people's access to capital um, in terms of housing, um, then you're really not dealing with the affordable housing issue. Um, uh, so within this uh, real economy, uh, there is a, there's, there's really a core foundational element of a skills pipeline um, that uh, not only facilitates people's ability to uh, produce uh, produce goods within this real economy that they can depend on in a localized uh, supply chain, but also um, have the skills that they can offer to the outside capital economy um, as well. And this can be this exchange uh, of, 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 of capital, because there are still, when it comes to real economy, when it comes to land, and when it comes to anything uh, in this society, there's a, there's a money barrier. Um, so you have to uh, insulate, uh, you would have to insulate this real economy from that money barrier. At the same time, you'd have to interact with that money barrier in order to bring goods and fundamental first things into this real economy. That's partially where things like a public bank's uh, investment power would be crucial um, to get something like this off the ground. Um, but in terms of keeping it afloat and keeping it in the air, um, this, this, sense, this second circle of an administrative entity um, really would take on the brunt of uh, really dealing with the capital pressures and capital demands um, that would like taxes and insurance um, and 
uh, and things like uh, maintenance, of course, and uh, equipment upkeep that the real economy on the inside would need um, to sort of continually fend off. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about how it will do that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just to, to dig in a little bit on the real economy, it really depends on the skills pipeline. Um, we're talking about an individual experience of being able to come in ultimately with no skills. We're not depending on the existing infrastructure to have provided in, in, in individuals with anything. Um, again, this is a prototype model. So the way these things take shape may be different based on a given implementation. But at the end of the day, these four core skills of farming, cooking, construction, and information technology would be core skills that... Uh, uh, a real economy, an economy that wanted to sort of insulate itself and, and generate goods within uh, what folks call a carpool model, among other things. Um, these four put pillars would really be what uh, the, 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 the material stability and the material dependency of the, of the, of the real economy is based on. After these are established, there's really um, an infinite, number of possibilities. You can build out um, accounting skills pipelines, healthcare skills pipelines, all sorts of legal serv uh, uh, professional services. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, individual member contribution is, is embedded into these skills and they can get certifications uh, via these skills uh, pipelines. Um, and we can just go to the next slide. Uh, Okay, something got completely messed up between my <laughs> when I made these slides and, and now. Um, but this is basically for houses. This is just a quick uh, sort of visual of how housing, uh, of how it might look. Uh, you might have, it doesn't have to look exactly like this. This is just a conceptual model, but you, you, you might have chefs living in a house, farmers living in another house, uh, builders uh, living in a third house. Um, and IT folks living in a fourth, right? The chefs are cooking the food that the farmers have just farmed. Um, and there's a farmland there just to represent the sort of land necessity that uh, is, is part of this model. Um, you, you know, the chefs and farmers are really dealing with the food necessities, but they're living in houses that the builders made and they're, they're working out of facilities that the builders built and the operations are being run and are being facilitated by um, the IT folks who are also facilitating um, the relationships with the cap the capital economy. Um, this uh, administrative entity um, would basically deal with the real economy, so individuals don't have to. Um, it's uh, managing, it's brokering relationships between uh, in, uh, operations going on inside uh, the real economy and if uh, a big part of the sustainability of this is that operations going on inside the real economy can s generate capital and that capital would be used to resist the capital pressures that are coming on the outside and it would be collectivized. Um, uh, and I'm running out of time, so I don't really want to go into too many details here. Um, within the capital economy, um, the now enriched individual has more freedom than they ever would. And a core part of this is that they're able to uh, engage in the capital economy without really compromising their personal stability. Their, their actual like human ability to survive is not tied to their ability to generate capital as an individual. Rather, um, uh, their ability to survive is, is tied to, you know, their, uh, their time, how much time they have and how much, how much they're able to give that time to contribute to the needs of uh, this localized uh, sort of insulated economy. Um, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide uh, about how the real economy can interact with the insulated econ uh, with, with the capital economy and how uh, that relationship can work, but it's, it's really too late for that. This, this had to, Move quickly. Thank you, though, everyone. <laughs> Brad, thank you. Lots of information. I believe we have permission to share slides, right, Brad? 
Yes. Okay, great. So we'll make those available. We do want to leave time for questions, though, because this is a people's forum. I believe Peter has been collecting questions. Peter, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, we have some uh, interesting input, uh, and it seems that there is, uh, when, when we think about these solutions and these these approaches, there seems to be a conflict between the desire to make things affordable, especially when instead of under 30%, the, uh, the cost of, of shelter now is really, for most people, more above 40%. So that's, the, that's where the, the tension is in terms of keeping costs low. But the other tension is to build wealth within the community and wealth for families. Uh, how does the approaches of a community land trust and cooperatives uh, m mediate between what seems to be conflicting values? Uh, maybe, Dan, you could address that first. You're on mute, Dan. Uh, that's an interesting question. It is, it is challenging. Um, I think uh, that's a challenging question. And uh, how do you, I think it creates some possibility of gaining equity uh, for people who might have no chance uh, while uh, not allowing all of that equity to pass through and some of it be retained by the community uh, so, uh, over a long term. So I think some, in some ways that's how to do it. Uh, I think in the, I didn't get to go through it all. One of the proposals that I make that frankly, I don't know where, why it hasn't been shot tried elsewhere, would be to allow uh, these districts to be, I was just answering a question somebody asked, also to be coterminous tax income and finance districts, where the property tax is paid rather than as property values rise, in part because of the activities of the land trust, to be recaptured by the land trust. And so uh, plowed in as a um, internal subsidy that, that they generate as opposed to simply sending all that money down to city hall. Uh, and all land trusts, as, as near as I know, face critical problems of how they're going to fund their operations long term. You need enough housing, you need enough land rent payers to make it work. Um, they need alternative additional revenue uh, streams. Um, the revenue stream I hate the most is begging to City Hall and begging to some foundation. Uh, I'm not saying I'm eliminating that problem, but I'm going to eliminate at least some. Uh, and that I'll leave to some clever uh, uh, person to figure out an area to uh, have as a dedicated land trust. But if you have enough stuff in it, you might have a, a way of handling that. Well, Dan, uh, thanks. I'm... I'm, 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 I'm a I'm sorry, M. Weiner uh, raised the question about mints, uh, uh, mixed income neighborhood trusts. Is that um, a, a diversification that, that uh, provides opportunity? Uh, maybe some an old guy. I think it's a complication. Uh, they're, they're, they mostly focus, to my understanding, is they mostly focus on rental rather than ownership. Uh, but keeping the places permanently affordable in the same way that land, uh, uh, the land trusts do. Uh, they also oftentimes have commercial properties that I think need to be governed and managed a little bit different. And they also have some open space that I think also have some different uh, management issues. Uh, so, and they also then focus on serving the needs oftentimes of particular populations. Uh, that's a lot of moving parts. If you can do it all, I guess God love you. So it's certainly uh, good stuff. But I'm a little more modest than in my old age, I guess. Peter, I saw Dina's hand when that question came out. Dina, do you want to say something quickly about this question? And then we'll get to others. Hi, thank you very much. I'll go very fast. So we represent, regional housing represents, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten land trusts throughout the city and throughout the state. And I think it depends on what your philosophic goal is, but that for our clients, they want to both control the land and have their communities be able to control the land for long-term community-based need. Um, and what we often say about the home ownership, I get what you're saying, Peter, it is a conflict between American sort of value about maximizing 
ownership interest and being able to use your home for wealth building, which is, you know, the way that most people in America have built wealth. Um, so we see it as an alternative to rental and as a stepping stone towards long-term affordable, like home ownership, right? So it is a shared equity model. You get something if you sell, but you also have the preservation of home ownership, security of home, support of the community that's around you when you're in the land trust. And if you want to sell, you get something. And if you want to go buy something that you get to get maximize your uh, equity, go for it, right? So that's how we talk about it with our clients because we recognize those those conflicts and those tensions. Thank you, Dina. Any more questions, Peter? Next one. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, this uh, questions here about uh, the property taxes and what would happen with property taxes that uh, that Dave has raised, um, and I'm wondering if if you address this. Um, or maybe Brad, you have some thoughts on this about uh, the way in which a business improvement district is, in essence, given the tax authority for, by the the city to tax its members uh, with assessments that is in in lieu of a uh, of a city tax as a source of, of revenue. So I wonder if if either of you have thoughts on that, Brad. Do you have any? Uh, any contribution on that issue? I actually had a lot to say on the last question. Um, this is definitely a more technical question. I will say that taxes on members of a, I mean, yeah, ta I, taxes are not necessarily the greatest thing to, uh, to be using for me just because they're a burden. Who are we, who are we taxing? Who is, re who is receiving the burden of these taxes? Um, are we dealing in, you know, we're dealing in these dollars again um, and not really in anything that is uh, actually securing uh, the, the stability uh, and the resource stability of the folks that we want to be securing resources for. We're, housing, so. it, housing cooperatives assess the, the members of the cooperative for, for, for common needs. Isn't that the, the equivalent of a tax? That, that, this is this is the purpose of the model that I was presenting. That's a fa that's that's I won't say that's a completely failed model. I will say that's a model that the that that is set up for failure because it depends on people's access to the regular economy, um, and therefore it is only as strong as their access to the regular economy is. Which the whole point is that they don't have that access really in a, in a strong manner. And so you have to develop their ability to uh, A, engage in that and B, to insulate them from that while they're developing those abilities um, and for as long really as necessary. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the idea rather than tax them financially and say, go find some way to get exploited, as I like to say, uh, and come back uh, with the money, um, rather you can contribute, um, your time and labor to the actual material needs of the people in this collective food, you know, these things that the capital economy wasn't providing even some of the best off of us, um, necessarily, uh, depending on what the next couple months or years bring, uh, it might completely drop off this extended, uh, supply chain that we use that that money gives us access to and that we're using money for and we're all caught up in money um so you know this is far more secure on those sort of on those levels um than to than to try and and squeeze blood out of out of rocks <laughs> Brad, I'm going to cut you off. Thank you so much for that. We are at 8.30 when we said we were going to end. I got a couple of slides of the sort of action steps for you all. I'm sorry we didn't have more time, um, but we're this is, this is the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to probably circle back to this conversation maybe in a future forum. Um, if we could get those slides up of the next steps, that'd be great. All right, so you heard a lot of things. You heard a lot of challenges tonight. You heard particularly about this community land trust, and I hope that we did a good job of, of, and I think our speakers did do a good job of really speaking to how the public bank that we will have eventually can really help to address some of these, particularly through these community land trusts. Thank you so much, all of the speakers. How can you get involved? You've heard so many things. 
we need people. We need you all to be engaged with us. Um, so come to our next Finance in Philadelphia's Future. We've got one on November 29th. And then again, on December 20th, those happen every month. Help us plan the next People's Economic Forum, the Small Business and Cooperatives Forum. I know we've got great folks here from other folks from PACA, including Brad. Um, and help plan what we're thinking about is a Move Your Money campaign for the city of Philadelphia to really help everyday folks understand what we're trying to do with the public bank to move our city's money out of Wall Street and to more alignment with what we need. But individuals can do that with their own money, with what banks or credit unions they choose. And then finally, you can join the PNN, the Philadelphia Neighborhood Network's Housing Action Committee that Gail leads, Gail um, who spoke earlier. This is a link, somebody is placing that link in the chat, all right? And then you can check the boxes that you're interested in helping us with or joining us with. Um, and then we will follow up. These are pictures of the big action that happened a few weeks ago, again, where they gave, uh, you know, they, they served the mayor a subpoena for not going forward and implementing this legislation that passed 15 to 1, 15 to 1. He has been ignoring the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition, and he is not moving forward. But that doesn't stop them. They are moving forward. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, again, is that link in the chat? I'm going to ask Susan to speak up and confirm that that link has been placed in the chat. It is. All right. Thank you. And again, when you're in the chat in the lower left corner, there are three dots. When you click those dots, one of the options is save chat. So go ahead and save chat if you'd like to. Now, I feel like, again, we might have, um, it feels like we rushed at the end. I'm willing to stay. Members of the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition who are out here are willing to stay. So happy to take another question. Peter, if you'd like to maybe give us another quick question, we can try to get one more in while people are hanging out. But for everybody else, if you need to go, we understand. And thank you so much for joining us. Peter. Uh, yeah, we've, we've gotten in sort of into a, a discussion of a, a, what would be a uh, the post-capitalist um, economy. And um, Brad, maybe you can uh, riff on that. Oh yeah, I mean, this is a public banking forum, so we, we, I, I do want to keep it grounded. Um, but you know, such a thing would take uh, you know a certain amount of capital input. I think one of the big things about the model that I was presenting, anyway, is. Um, it seeks to sort of break down a lot of the money walls that I like to say between resources and means of production um, uh, and the regular individual. Um, a lot of the reason why we, you know, find ourselves in, uh, I guess, class stagnancy or social immobility um, is that there are money walls that are, uh, you know, this is why debt is such a thing. People are trying to get over those, the, Get get to resources that are behind these financial uh, barriers, and then they are sort of crippling themselves in the long term and ladening themselves with this, uh, you know, very long term financial weight. Um, uh, and that's sort of like the phenomenon of debt. Um, and so, uh, a public bank is supposed to be sort of like kind of get us get us into a less predatory. Uh, uh, dynamic uh, of of debt, I suppose, hopefully, um, and a more uh, holistically focused dynamic of 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 debt that 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 that's coming back in, and as uh, the colleague was saying, in a kind of where debt, almost like the taxes would be funneled back in, this sort of debt service would be funneled back in to different things that 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 serve. The, uh, the 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 general the general public good, um, but in terms of post capital, it, to to get out of capital, you have to you have to break down the money walls uh, that uh, are holding the means of production, um, and you have to get past those things uh, and 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 bring them into a space that does not depend on produce without depending on capital where basically you have to get to the end of the supply chain 
<laughs> you have to you have to get to the end of the supply chain you way down to the, the point of the original product uh, as far as you can um, and own that um, without having to pay somebody else uh, the money who's existing outside who only exchange that thing for money. Um, so it's it's a matter of being able to buy up uh, buy buy things out of the capital economy and 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 keep them in. A, and and remove them from the money system and, and, and so that they don't become money anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, that, so that this house no longer has a value that it's about to become money and that's the sort of only value of this house, but rather we're taking it out. It's no longer gonna become money. It's We've siphoned it from the capital economy and now it's strictly a resource um, and it's gonna stay that way. This tractor is strictly a resource now. Um, this land is strictly a resource. Um, and it doesn't really have any monetary value anymore. Um, it's only has resource value. So, uh, so Dana, do, uh, do you think that the role of speculation can be uh, led out of the, the way in which we do things in Philadelphia? Uh, I mean, Philadelphia can't control the larger environment than which we're operating, but I do agree with Brad that we can find ways to corral the larger speculative market. I mean, both, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I believe in the regulation of law, but I think we can create um, operating um, mechanisms and financial mechanisms that can try to reduce the speculation and, and, and to try to limit the speculative nature of like the commodification of real estate. And I, I totally agree with like with Brad that we can't um, you know, it's, it's like an apples and apples. People can't play in that sandbox if they don't have the resources to play in that sandbox. And so we have to find a way to kind of find an alternative mechanism, an alternative, I wouldn't say market, but we need a way to at least preserve the land outside of that. So I think we can, but I don't think it's easy and I don't think it's, you know, universal. All right, Peter, we still got 38 people. If you want to try one more question, we just have an audience, but I want to be respectful of our speakers that uh, we should probably shut it down in the next, you know, definitely within the next five to 10 minutes. Do you have another question, Peter? Uh, yes, I, 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 would, I would ask um, a, a Gail, uh, I, basically all of our, our speakers, um, what the interaction and the, and the role is between the financial authority uh, and legislation, um, you know, I, it, <coughs> where, where's the dividing line in terms of, of what can be done uh, with a public bank as opposed to what can be done with local legislation? There are kinds of local legislation, like you need, you know, it's a both and, right? Is that what you're saying that, Peter, you're asking if it's a both and? We need a yeah. public bank so that we can we can open up systems of capital and change perhaps some of the underlying or underwrite, you know, underwriting mechanisms, but we but we also need other kinds of legislations to be protective, right? So we need for tenants, we need laws that will limit rent increases. We're not going to get rent control, but rent increases, right? We need ways of making sure that properties are properly um maintained and that you know the people are held accountable the whole homes repair bill that's statewide should you know should help in many ways but so i to me i think it's a both and like we are part of this structure and system that has real estate as a commodity and that is a long probably beyond my lifetime shift of value in the united states right but that um so we need laws to kind of fight against that and we need a bank that can open up the market so that people can play with these other models and feel like they they have an opp an opportunity to participate in these other models. And I mean, I I love Brad's uh uh conversation about um you know taking the 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 properties out of the monetary system. You know the barter system is a real system. Um, I don't, I don't know if fully ready for that kind of trend, but you know it's something to to you know kind of like reach for and and to uh, uh, check out. 
but I would like to see uh, the the public bank receive monies from, you know, now that we have the 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 uh, community land trust being funded on an annual basis by the city, and the mayor can't go use it when he want to have that money, that type of money put into the 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 public bank to start a funding uh, trend and a funding thought process on where we need to see uh, uh, monies that can support and help uh, and reinvest in the communities. If that's what it's about, then you need to put it in that mission-driven uh, public banking uh, instrument in order to uh, see that come into fruition. There are other um, uh, policies that we don't even see anymore. I'm the benefit of uh, generational wealth where the house that I live in, my parents got for a dollar. Where is that program anymore? Um, PHA now sells a stock of their properties to investors as opposed to what their job used to be was to um, uh, take care and home and, and, and provide shelter and support to low-income individuals. And now uh, whatever their... Uh, reportability to uh, the government is that's no longer their job. You know, um, they sell lots of homes uh, to investors. So, you know, my, my concern is those types of issues. And one of my questions to you, Dina, uh, was um, <laughs> you guys may be doing a better job at that than Philadelphia Housing Authority. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I Our got so much. don't control the land. We just, once we get that, <laughs> once we get it, we try to, you know, be as aggressive and assertive as we can in meeting our clients' needs to get control that's long-term, you know, mm -hmm. not always per in perpetuity, but long-term. But the Housing Authority is the largest provider of affordability in the city. But it does, as Peter said, it doesn't build wealth. And so I would really encourage this group to also reach out to comp to the um, is it Compass Compact and um, to really have a conversation about the wealth building that's being done within the Public Housing Authority through Compass um, Compact. And um, All right. Was, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Gail. Great comments and suggestions to close up on. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us.